What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to the Zero to Hear podcast. I am your host, Denny Duma. Tonight on the podcast, Dr. Elizabeth Walkovich. Uh, she is a climate change expert. She focuses mainly in the uh, biological sector, which is plant growth. Uh, we talk a lot about grapes uh, and growing or vineyards and growing grapes um, for wine and how that has shifted with the earth's temperature rising. There is a lot of, uh, a ton of good information in this one. So have a listen and I'd love to hear your feedback. Good evening, Lizzie. Thanks for coming on the show. How are you doing today? Thanks for having me. I'm doing well. Good, good. I am super pumped as we were kind of just talking about before we started recording. Listen to a very interesting Joe Rogan podcast. And I know you're going to have to check out Joe Rogan because you have never listened to a Joe Rogan podcast before. Um, with David Wallace Wells, he is a... You, well, you've met him, so why don't you give him a little bit of an introduction, because you know more about him than I do. Sure. So David Wallace Wells is a journalist. I think he's now managing editor or such, or at least was when I met him a year and a half ago at New York Magazine. He is someone who got interested in climate change, causes, consequences several years ago, and he dove deep in the science. He talked to a lot of the leading scientists in the climate side. So what's going to happen with temperatures changing? He talked to the experts for sea level rise. And he went and talked to people about impacts. And he got very interested in not thinking so much about what climate scientists and researchers like myself like to focus on, which is sort of what's the average that we think will happen? Because the average is by default the most likely outcome. And he wanted to talk about, well, what's the worst case scenario? And so he put together much research into this article called The Uninhabitable Earth, which was published two or three years ago now in New York Magazine. And it basically did what journalists hadn't done before and what I think most climate scientists had zero interest in doing, which is talking about the worst case scenario, which is the most unlikely scenario in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it was a massive hit. It had tons of readership. It was the most clicked on and well-read New York Magazine article basically ever for articles that had words. I'm told he was beat out by a Lindsay Lohan spread (laughs) or a couple other articles that don't actually count as, you know, written word articles and he basically tapped into something that the public wanted to hear about that nobody was telling them about which was okay here's what we think is most likely to happen there's lots of information on that if you dig for it but he looked at what was the sort of worst case scenarios and since then he's worked on a book that came out maybe a month ago at most called the uninhabitable earth which is a much longer treatise and examination of the same sort of question of what's the worst case scenario for people with climate change why do scientists not like talking about extremes? And is, is he the first person to actually bring it to public light? I don't think he's the first person. Certainly there's been a few other people who talk about extremes, but the whole purpose of this article he published was, let's imagine the worst case scenario outcome for climate change and what would the earth look like? And he painted the picture of mm. where would we have deserts that we don't have deserts today? What, how high could sea levels actually go? And he did it very thoughtfully, and he did it also with extreme rigor. So I think he did a fairly good job of actually interviewing the scientists, collecting the data, and doing um, a much better job than perhaps others had done who had tried to do that. And so it became incredibly popular. Why scientists don't want to do it, I think, is multifold. One is, as a scientist, you spend part of your time being trained into statistics, and part of statistics is trying to figure out the most likely outcome. <laughs> and so the mean, the average, the median, those are all ways that we say, okay, this is the most likely value, this is the most likely future, and we want to communicate something that we think is most likely to happen. So right. we want to focus on those things. Um, you know statistically that when you start talking about, well, what's the least likely thing to happen, that it might not happen, that it's sort of most likely to not happen based on how we do our science. Um, So people don't want to talk about it. I think there's also certainly, in my experience, climate scientists are shaped by how much disinformation there is for climate change. And so many 
of the people who are out there talking about climate change and being spokespersons for it have been trained to be very careful in what they say so that it's always extremely accurate and that it's always the most likely outcome because there is such a large campaign um, through the fossil fuel industry and other industries to try to pervert the messages and um, come down on climate scientists who ever get anything wrong or when things don't turn out the way they said. (laughs) They want to showcase that and make sure everyone knows that they were wrong. And I think the sad truth is that climate scientists have been incredibly accurate. The amount of warming we have now is what we predicted 10 or 15 years ago. The models we have for how warm we think it will be in the future, those predictions don't change much. We aren't um, uncertain about how warm it will probably be by the end of the century, except that we're totally uncertain about how much more people will emit greenhouse gases. And that's where the uncertainty lies today. So in summary, just what I'm hearing is it's scientists are fairly good at predicting outcomes, looking at the past into terms of where we are today, Mm -hmm. but they don't want to predict what the earth will look like at those outcomes. No, I think it's that they don't want to predict. We've been pretty accurate in predicting from the past what has happened today. And those predictions have been based on the averages. Yeah. And what David Wallace Wells is doing is saying, well, let's go forward and predict and say, what's the extreme outcome? And that's not the average. That's sort of the worst case scenario. That's like, there's a 50% chance we think the world will warm X amount, but there's a 5% chance it'll warm this much, much higher variable amount. And scientists don't want to fixate on things that are unlikely. Fair enough. (laughs) Carl's looking frightened already over there. Can we, can you just provide some general knowledge in terms of, um, first of all, what is climate change and what is the cause? Sure. I mean, the term climate change actually applies to lots of other things that have happened in the history of the earth where the long-term weather. So, you know, the long-term weather in Vancouver is that it's mild and temperatures are cooler in the winter than the summer. Um, any change in that long-term weather, which is what climate is in the past is called climate change. Today, we use it to describe anthropogenic climate change. So that's the warming that we're experiencing over the last 100 or so years that is caused by greenhouse gas emissions by people through things like burning fossil fuels, driving cars, flying in planes. And it basically, it's like, it's called the greenhouse effect because it works like a greenhouse. The earth has an atmosphere. And as we pump more gases into it, that makes it warm up more and more. And we just have a feedback cycle where as we pump more gases into it, it gets warmer. Other things melt. Permafrost, as we talked about, produces more um, greenhouse gases as well. And then we get more and more warming. So we were talking about cars and air travel being a very small percentage. What are big percentages of? Cars are a big percentage, actually. Okay. Um, w- What we were talking about is that there's this sort of trick between what are the things causing the most, the highest, the greatest magnitude of the greenhouse gas emissions? And then what are the things per capita that you can change that cause your footprint, as we call it, to be bigger or smaller? So our per capita footprints are heavily impacted by air travel. They're also heavily impacted by, for example, our diets and whether we eat meat and where the meat comes from. If we have children, because we're in charge of their greenhouse gas footprints and the way they do the calculations. But on a global scale, the big issues are, um, so for Canada and for much of the world, 20 to 30 percent is transportation. A small fraction of that is planes. So air travel, okay. for example, it, within Canada, it's 1 percent. Within the world, I think it's about 2 percent of all okay. greenhouse gas emissions. So if we all stopped flying planes tomorrow, we wouldn't really put a dent in the problem with climate change. In terms of being able to have an impact on my own footprint and say that I'm contributing fewer greenhouse gas emissions, not flying would be a huge way to do that for me. Um, The other things are fuel combustion. This is a huge thing in um, Canada. So a large proportion of the problem in Canada is due to things like the mining industry, the fossil fuel exploration part of fossil fuels, um, and forestry. Those are, I can look it up, I had it written down, something like 20 or 30% of the problem. Um, And then there's smaller pieces. Agriculture is around 10% in most countries. So we actually produce greenhouse gases when we grow the plants that we want to eat. And with livestock, livestock is a huge issue. And trying to see what the other ones are. 
industries that aren't covered by transportation or fossil fuel combustion. So that's things like the chemical industry has a pretty large impact, somewhere between 3 to 8 percent, depending on the country. And those all add up. So transportation writ large, trains, planes, automobiles, a lot of that is really big trucks. The trucks used to right. transport food, the trucks we're not driving, that's 20 to 30 percent. And then the biggest problem is fossil fuel combustion. Part of that is heat and electricity that persons and people use in their homes. And then a large part is exploration, mining, um, as well as heating public buildings and things like that. So carbon footprint, greenhouse gases, this is heating the earth. Yes. Quicker than it should. Much quicker than is good probably for any of us. So what side effects are we seeing from... Well, let me ask ask you this. What temperature range are we talking about that the Earth is heating? So the Earth has warmed about one degree Celsius since the late 1800s. Most of that warming has occurred since the early 1980s. And people often talk about like the global thermometer temperature. The globe has a fever. And I think it is a good comparison because when people have a small change in their temperature, that's a big deal. And for the globe, it's the same thing. A one degree C temperature change is enormous. That is the warmest the globe has been in probably hundreds of thousands of years. Um, We're projecting somewhere between a three to four degree warming event by the end of the century. We're really ramping up the heating that we've caused. And a four to six degree cooling event would be an ice age. So hopefully that helps put things on the scale. You know, the good side of the climate change story, and I think also a side that can help people understand how big these degrees of warming are. So a four to six degree event of cooling would be an ice age. We aren't having an ice age anytime in the future that we know of, whereas based on our climate records, we should have been heading into an ice age soon. So when I was little, Mm -hmm. growing up in the early 80s, used to be able to watch um, science documentaries, if you were me, about... um, (laughs) the fear that another ice age was coming and the scientists who tried to predict when the next ice age would come because it has to do with the oscillations of the earth and it's something we can kind of predict and how could we have a better sort of a clearer and a finer resolution on is it going to happen in 100 years is it going to happen in <laughs> 700 2000 when's it coming and you know this quiet little thing was happening at the same time i was watching those tv shows as a kid which is that humans had obliterated the next ice age, which would have been a problem. I think we'd all agree that an ice age would be a problem. And yet we've caused the opposite of an ice age. We're about to warm the globe on the scale of coming out of another ice age that we don't need to come out of. So it's, it's an immense amount of warming. It affects um, how plants work, how we're going to be able to actually deal with where people live. The sea level rise consequences to me are the greatest threat. And it'll change the disease factors. Lots of things that make your life good about where you live probably have to do with how hot it gets or how cool it gets. And so you'll see a lot of changes that are immediate, like summers in Vancouver have been warmer. Mm -hmm. They'll keep getting warmer. And then you'll see these knock-on effects, like diseases that couldn't survive the winter or vectors such as mosquitoes that never survived the winter are going to start showing up places where we didn't have them before. And so I think it's hard to think through all of those consequences, but they're enormous. So before, so from the late 1800s till now, it's gone up of approximately one degree. Yeah, Celsius. And for the previous 10,000 years, it was very flat? So the previous 10,000 years are an era we call the Holocene, which is the sort of modern warming period. And so, yes, for the previous 10,000 years, we had small fluctuations in little parts of the globe. Like there was a period in Europe called the Little Ice Age where it got a little cooler. Um, probably not on the scale of one degree Celsius. We had minor cooling for a year or two in the 1990s due to the Mount Pinatuba eruption. Um, We certainly saw one or two year anomalies um, or sometimes maybe a couple, I don't know how long the Little Ice Age lasted for, but certainly more than one or two years, but nothing on the magnitude of a degree Celsius. And if you go back before 10,000 years, you start to go back into the last glacial period when there was a glacier across most of North America. And Remember, Canada is still rebounding from the last glacial maximum. Like literally the earth in Canada is still coming up from the weight of the glacier on it. So these were massive changes just for the earth being a relatively tiny bit cooler. One degree to me sound, like doesn't sound, and I'm sure for a lot of people, doesn't sound like very significant. But I think the way you just explained it makes more sense in terms of like the human body yes. rising a, a 
a degree yeah. is a lot. You have a fever or whatever. And I think that's why it's been one of the good examples is because that's a spot where, you know, one degree is a huge amount. And for the Earth, it's a similar part. The other thing to remember is that the, the warming is unequal. We will see much more warming in the northern hemisphere. And as we move towards the poles, than we'll see at the equator hmm. and relatively less in the southern hemisphere. And so Canada is one of the places on Earth that will warm by far the most. Europe is as well. Europe has already warmed much more than one degree Celsius. If you look at France, it's warmed at least 1.6, maybe 1.8 degrees Celsius. So this is a one degree average. And places like northern Canada are looking at eight degrees Celsius potential really? warming by the end of the century. That's more significant. Eight, <laughs> jeez. Well, that's, I mean, this is the maps I look at constantly. You see this. You know, it's the oranges and yellows in the sort of U.S. And then as you move up and get closer and closer to the Arctic, that's where the most extreme warming is predicted. And those are places that have already seen upwards of two degrees Celsius warming. So they're already en route to six to eight degrees warming. What, what causes that? Why is it located up there? It's a mix of things. A big part of it is that part of it is just how the ocean climate works. Part of it is how the climate system works. And the other issue going on is that that's a place where there is no land under the sea ice and the um, Arctic area. So when that goes, it allows for a more rapid feedback to warm that polar cap, whereas Antarctica will always stay a little bit cooler because there is a landmass that will hold on to those glaciers. And we certainly do expect, under most scenarios I've seen um, in the near future, to have an ice-free Arctic for the summer months. And, and part of that feedback is that the northern hemisphere and the parts closest to the Arctic will warm an enormous amount. And so if one degree sounds low, you can think of it in comparison to the human body temperature. The other thing you can think is if you live in a northern latitude, that one degree is much lower than what you are going to experience and have already experienced. Right. What, I guess, what are the side effects on the Earth right now that we're seeing in the last hundred years of one degree going up? I mean, there's lots of indications of sort of simple things that we expected would happen. So what I study is plant phenology, which is the timing of recurring life history events. So things like when birds start migration every year from the tropics or when they lay their first egg, when tent caterpillars come out on Vancouver Island. Uh, I study specifically leaf out and flowering of plants. That's moved up an average of four to six days per degree Celsius, except that there's again variability. So places that have warmed more, that warming has caused a greater advance in spring and early species advance much more. So the cherry blossoms in Washington, DC are some of the earliest spring species we see every year hmm. where we have a long-term record. Those have advanced three weeks. Um, wine grape harvests in France have advanced at least three weeks since the 1970s. So there's variability among different species and how much they change. And so the ones that are very sensitive to temperature are advancing rapidly. Um, we also have seen impacts on sea level rise, obviously sort of the um, abiotic impacts. And then we're starting to more often observe shifts in wildfires. We're seeing more intense storms throughout the Pacific and Atlantic in terms of hurricanes and cyclones. And all of that is just, I think, a taster of what is coming and is part of the reason I think David Wallace Wells and others have been trying to mobilize people to think about the worst case. Because to me, the average case is just unimaginably frightening, but I sit around and think about it all the time. And maybe it's easier to think about the worst case and try to mobilize against that. What do scientists think about David Wallace Wells and his, what he's doing right now in terms of exposing the extreme? I think there's highly variable responses to what David Wallace Wells is doing. Right after he published his original article in New York Magazine, people like Michael Mann and other famous climate scientists were up in arms because they were quoted <laughs> and, <laughs> and were upset. And then uh, I think he, the issue was that he, so he did this amazing thing where he actually published an annotated version of his article where you could, he highlighted almost every single sentence and you could click on it and read the attribution. So he'd say, you can go to this paper and this mm. is where the data on hail and how big hail could be in the future and how much hail storms could increase in frequency comes from. And I've gone and clicked on some of them and thought, well, you know, that's not the strongest science, but it is a possibility. And that paper 
is a good citation. You know, he's not making any of this up. He's not citing phony science in any way, shape, or form. And so I think as that percolated, as he published the annotated version, as he talked to the people who were upset, many people have sort of come down. And the other thing I don't know as much about, but certainly how I feel, is that he tapped into something the public wanted to hear about. And I think for many climate scientists, that is emboldening and promising. Like if, if, if this is a message maybe we haven't been so excited to share because it's extreme, but it does get people more interested in talking about what the future looks like, mm. that maybe that's an alternate route. And I think the other thing he's done a good job with, at least when I've spoken with him, is that sort of the idea that there's, there's no correct way to communicate a certain message on climate change. Like, why can't we talk about the averages as well as the extremes? And I often think there's almost like a militant point of view on personal carbon footprints, that we should all be vegan and <laughs> not flying on planes and have one child. I mean, you could decide what would be the best way to minimize your carbon footprint, given the information you have. I would argue it's actually really hard sometimes to figure out the best way to reduce your carbon footprint in certain cases in terms of diet or other things. We could all go do that. And I think in some ways that's alienated a portion of the population, for example, that wants to drive a truck and eat red meat. And, and to me, I think David Wallace Wells has offered sort of an alternative view, which is we need to mobilize action on policy. And that's a big thing that he's interested in. He could tell you in many ways how to reduce your carbon footprint. I could tell you some basics. And I would say that is a fantastic thing for you to do. It will probably spread out and influence people around you who will choose to change their carbon footprints in little ways, and that will have a bigger and bigger impact. But at the end of the day, if you're driving a giant truck and eating red meat and you're voting for the politicians who are going to push for carbon taxes and the policies that would reduce carbon, I personally wouldn't argue that you're doing anything worse for the world than someone who's not getting out the vote or isn't out there voting for those policies and is vegan and is flying um, never in a plane, for example. So I yeah. think there's, there's multiple pathways to the solution and we should be more open to communicating the multiple ways the story could go with climate change and the multiple ways you can make a difference if it's something you care about. What, um, we kind of talked about this earlier, but is, is education the biggest thing? Because I feel like not very many... Uh, from my own personal experience, I didn't really know much of what was going on until listening to that podcast. And one thing Joe mentioned there was it's hard to live your life for the future. Most people are living for today and they're thinking, if I drive across town to work, am I really making a difference or does it really matter in terms of the global scale? But how would you talk to people that maybe are focusing on them necessarily not having any impact them cutting down their carbon footprint isn't really going to change what's going to happen in the next hundred years because they're such a small little piece i guess on the contrary if, if everyone thinks it won't make a difference and no one does it of course it won't make a difference but yeah. if everyone is mobilized to do it i think it will make a huge difference and i think it it has these knock-on effects that if you're choosing to change your carbon footprint, it starts a conversation with others around you who choose to do it as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where science has shown, you know, changing your light bulbs, but then acknowledging that you change to LED lights can have a bigger effect than you think because your neighbors start doing it or your friends start doing it. And so I agree, if you just make personal carbon choices and never speak about them and never do anything else to deal or talk about climate change, it probably has a small impact that doesn't really do anything. But the reality is people who choose to change their carbon footprint are also those who choose often to talk about it. So they change someone else's carbon footprint. Right. And I think they elevate the discussion to, these are small changes I can make that I'm willing to make for the future. And that starts the conversation about the future. One of the biggest problems with communication and climate change or with climate change and inaction is that it is in some ways a future problem. Like the worst consequences will happen in 100 years or 50 years, or it's, I mean, the worst consequences will be sea level rise and we can't predict the timing of the big ice sheet, cl sheet collapse collapses very well, but it will happen. And I think also people are starting to notice that it is happening in terms of communication with, from my perspective, there's been a, a major shift from 10 years ago talking about climate change with people to today. 
where much more people see the impact Mm -hmm. or they've heard about it or they're starting to think, yeah, it does really seem like we're having more wildfire fires or I am really kind of concerned with how many high heat days we're having. And I think it's not a future problem at this point. It's a now problem. It is a problem where the changes we make today, we won't reap the benefits right away. We're going to keep warming no matter what we do because of the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. But I think it's a tractable problem to reduce emissions and that it will have enormous consequences for our lifetimes and how good they go and sort of the disasters we have to watch or not watch due to sea level rise and just um, amazing effects for future generations. Even being a kid in BC, I don't remember forest fires being an issue. Never, no. It's only like the last couple of years that it's really gone crazy. Yeah. And it's just got so out of control so quickly. Yeah. Which I guess maybe is part of the reason I'm so curious. Right? I think I think people in all sorts of different parts of the world, if you're impacted by cyclones, you're starting to wonder why the cyclones are so mm. intense. If you're impacted by hurricanes, that's the same thing. Wildfires out here are certainly increasing in frequency. And this is things that are more or less rare events, like wildfires, were hard to predict and hard to say if they're changing. It was always predicted that wildfires would increase. It was hard to say how much. But we now know that they are increasing with climate change because droughts are increasing. And Mm -hmm. that was something else we always expected. And certainly we're seeing that as well. And warmer oceans bring more hurricanes, drier soils, drier trees bring more um, wildfires. And again, I don't know how much we're seeing this in British Columbia yet, but certainly other places are starting to see pest outbreaks in their forests that Mm -hmm. are due to climate change. So for example, when I was a graduate student in the early 2000s, there was a there's a very big beetle related to the mountain pine beetle, which is the southern pine beetle, which was restricted to Alabama, Georgia. And there was a team of researchers at Dartmouth where I did my PhD that used to try to track the outbreaks. And this is an outbreak dynamic. So usually the beetles are everywhere, just like the mountain pine beetle is always somewhere. It doesn't really go away, but it's in such a low density that it's almost impossible to find. Hmm. And so the team was constantly waiting for news of an outbreak and then they would jump in their car and drive all the way to louisiana emitting copious greenhouse gases and try to track the outbreak and figure out why there were these outbreak dynamics and so they've been doing this for the entire history of the lab and for generations before so it's like 60 years of studying the southern pine beetle in louisiana alabama sometimes georgia and then it went silent for several years and it was a bit weird for the lab because they really had nothing to do if there wasn't an outbreak And then it appeared in New Jersey Pine Barrens. And that was in the mid 2000s. And it was shocking to think that here's a species we've almost never seen outside of Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi, maybe Alabama. And how did it get to New Jersey? Hmm. And they did a lot of work to show that winters in New Jersey got warmer and the species can now survive a winter in New Jersey. And so now we have pest outbreaks in New Jersey those certainly weaken the forests and make it easier to have wildfires. And these are the knock-on effects that I think in many ways David Wallace Wells was really talking about. Because the worst case scenarios usually involve, well, this happens, and then this causes that to happen, Mm -hmm. and then we end up in a feedback that we don't want to be in. You got to listen to it. It's pretty crazy. (laughs) Uh, Let's talk a little bit more about your expertise area. Um, And just kind of the research you're doing on plant life and flower life and i guess what 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 is it why is it what is it negative that they're sprouting or blooming mm. three days early or four days early yeah I, I don't think it's necessarily negative that plants are leafing out and starting phenology earlier every spring but it in all these cases with climate change it's not necessarily a negative outcome it just means something you're used to is going to go away So, for example, I don't know who's been skiing at Whistler recently, but have you noticed that the Horseman um, T-Bar chair is no longer operational? Does anyone anyone ski at Whistler? I haven't been in two years. Okay. Where's the Horseman chair? It's on the upper side of Blackcomb. So when you go Uh, up Blackcomb, when I was a postdoctoral fellow here in 2012, I would always take this T-Bar up to the top of Whistler. This is obviously a side story. Um... And it was like the best way to get to a bunch of different things. And then since I moved back and it's only five years later, this T-bar is never operational. And I had started to notice that it's actually kind of hanging in midair. <laughs> and so I asked, 
around and they said yes the glacier is declining oh, so the horseman glacier has declined substantially to the extent that they can't run the horseman t-bar most years and they try to move snow around and engineer ways to open it but whistler blackcomb has a long-term plan to totally redo the upper portion of lifts in the mountains because they're dependent on the glaciers in those mountains and those glaciers are on their way out and so for me, wow. it's like, is it negative that the Horseman Glacier is going away? Will it lead to any really horrible impact that I can say is bad in terms of anything other than climate change, which was already happening? No. But it was emotional for me to think that I had just witnessed like a way of skiing that I won't ever get to do again. And when you get to the top, there's like little pieces that are closed that used to be able to ski in to get over different places. Yeah. And that's gone. And so I think there's that aspect of it's not necessarily all negative. It is all change. And humans are not used to this level of change. I do think we're very adaptable and can deal with change, which is why I'm not horribly panicked right now at this moment about climate change, because um, I think there's still time to make a difference. And the time is now. But in terms of plants, the outcomes are just that if we have a situation where plants are advancing, they're leafing out earlier, what we're probably going to see is that some species are really good at that change and some species are really bad. And that's what I'm predominantly interested in. So what I specifically try to look at for British Columbia forest right now is if we have a community of species that are all out there and some of them leaf out early and they're kind of the weedy ones that don't really compete for resources well, but they get out early, they get all the sun they need before the other species show up, they use their soil resources, that's their way of getting by. What happens to them versus other species that leaf out a little later and aren't advancing as much with climate change and are maybe better competitors? And it's, it's expected to just change the dynamics of the whole community. So you'll start to see some species be what we call winners with climate change and some species be losers. And I'm really interested as a researcher in understanding that and trying to predict that. So I have that whole area, which is really what I trained in, which is called community ecology. And then I have this whole separate area I stumbled into with wine grapes and climate <laughs> change um, because I don't know, 10 years ago, nine years ago, it was right before I moved to BC in 2012, actually. No, it was slightly before then, but right before I moved here in 2012, I, I finally got someone to answer some of my questions about wine grapes and climate change. Wine grapes are the most phenologically diverse crop or really plant species that I know of. If you take a bunch of different varieties of wine grapes, so like Pinot Noir is just a tiny bit genetically different than Cabernet Sauvignon, and okay. that's a tiny bit different than Sauvignon Blanc. Actually, Cabernet Sauvignon is Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc mated, and that produces Cabernet Sauvignon. So they're all just like siblings, basically, of one <laughs> another. They're like very genetically related. Um, you can plant them all together in the same climate and you'll have some species flowering six or varieties flowering six weeks before another variety. And so, or you'll have one variety that bud bursts early and another variety that takes another four weeks to even bud burst. And that amount of diversity within just one little subspecies is astronomically amazing. And I think it's something humans created because they wanted wine grapes all over the earth. So back in Europe when they were um, developing domesticated wine grapes. They figured out a way to get some of them to survive in Germany and some of them to survive in Greece and Southern Italy. And the way to do that is to have some of them need a short, quick growing season and some of them survive a hot, long growing season. Mm -hmm. So I got interested in wine grapes because they have this incredible diversity of how different they are, even though they're just micro genetically different. So how is the um, earth's temperature rising affecting the growth of grapes. Yeah, so the other reason I got interested in wine grapes is wine grape harvest records are some of the longest written records on earth. Wow, okay. So they compete only with the cherry blossom records in Asia. Hmm. Wine grape harvest records in France go back to at least the 1300s. Jeez, really? <laughs> yes. Um, and it's partially because wine is connected to the Catholic Church, mm -hmm. and the Catholic Church is really good at collecting records. Okay. So we have these phenomenal records of when the harvest happened in Burgundy in France going back to the 1300s, so 700 years. 700 years of phenology, basically, is much more years of data we have than temperatures, uh, and sorry, in terms of thermometers. So thermometers were invented several hundred years really later than that. Okay. And before there were thermometers, people would compare the phenology of plants to figure out what the climate was. 
And so people have used these records to understand and to actually recreate climate in the past. You can guess at what the climate was based on when the harvest happened in Burgundy. So we have a pretty good estimate of how much the harvest has changed in France, and it's a minimum right now of about three weeks since the 1970s, and that's averaged across of France. So some parts of northern France have maybe shifted a little more, um, some parts have shifted a little less, but we certainly see that they're harvesting much earlier, and there are, again, additional effects. So when you harvest grapes earlier, you have to harvest them when it's hotter. When you harvest when it's hotter, you harvest high alcohol grapes. So you may not have noticed, but on average, you're drinking an alcohol level of 15% sometimes in wine. Yeah. And having just moved to Canada, I can tell you the Canadian government thinks that it's not wine after 13% alcohol. 13 <laughs> and, is a cutoff. So 13 is the cutoff. So it calls it liquor afterwards? Uh, it's a fortified wine. The yeah. idea being that to have gotten such a high alcohol content, you should have had to add sugar. Uh. But right now, for several reasons, I mean, one is there is a push towards uh, fruitier wines, and those tend to be higher alcohol. But a large portion of why the alcohol or the wines you pick up in the store are high alcohol is climate change. People have to harvest grapes when it's hotter. You ha harvest a grape at a hotter temperature, you're going to get a high sugar grape. That sugar converts to alcohol. And what would have been a 12% wine 30 years ago is 15%. I've seen 15.5%. So I'm assuming, obviously, with the increased alcohol percentage and just the change in harvesting, that the flavor profiles are changing. Yes. And <laughs> are vineyards very open to trying new things, or are they just saying, okay, well, our wine's different now? Or are they altering them to... Because I'm, I assume that there's a ton of wineries out there that are known for a specific thing, a Barola from Italy, a Bordeaux from what from France. And they're changing. Yes. And people, I assume, don't like that. <laughs> There's actually, I got contacted by a film person recently who wants to do a film about the idea that if you buy land in Bordeaux right now, you're sort of being scammed because the climate is changing so rapidly in Bordeaux that it's not exactly the land you think you're buying. Mm. Um, but basically, I will say, I think every area of the world growing wine grapes right now is heavily impacted by climate change because they're so sensitive. The mm -hmm. fact that we've used climate, we've reconstructed climate from wine grape records is part of why people call them a canary in the cold mine. Like they're changing very rapidly. How much growers want to talk about that change depends on many things. I would argue that growers in regions that can gather a very high price for their wines do not want to talk about climate change. So growers in general in Napa, California, will talk to me less about it than growers in BC, for example. So I think BC has benefited in many ways from warming. Um, growers in the United Kingdom, where they didn't really grow um, wine grapes that were 100% wine grapes until very recently, are excited to talk about climate change because they can grow champagne grapes now. And they really mm. couldn't grow champagne grapes 40 years ago. It was just too damn cold and rainy <laughs> and, and sort of, you know, not the best of weather in the south of England. And now you have companies like Tattinger, which is one of the leading champagne companies, which has bought a large chunk of land in the United Kingdom. Companies in Bordeaux are buying in China. So I think everyone in the wine industry knows the wine's changing. The growers with the capability are buying land where they think the new climate is. Mm. And the growers without it are trying to make small changes. So, for example, in Napa, there's been, for over a decade at least in Napa, growers have used a shade cloth system where in June or July, you just go put shade over your plants. And that's just literally trying to change the microclimate above in the air right above your vines to try to bring it down to a temperature where the vines can survive without having really sort of what we called stall veraison and other issues with development because it's just too hot. Plants don't want to be above 40 C and we're getting multiple days above 40 C in Napa now. Um, they've also invested in micro mist systems. So if you've <laughs> ever been to like a cafe somewhere really hot yeah. and they have like a, that weird spritzer thing out yeah. front and it's incredibly refreshing. The reason it's incredibly refreshing is it reduces the temperature like two to three degrees C minimum. So it's like walking into this teeny tiny world that is at least two degrees C cooler. And so the, the technique in Napa has been, well, we'll just buy these micro mist systems, which are incredibly expensive, and we will micro mist the temperature of our vines down 
that system requires a ton of water and a ton of money. And I think will eventually have knock on effects where you'll start getting more disease and mildew because you just made your vines wet to keep them cool. Doesn't um, that alter the growth of the grapes too? Though? I think the Over issue is the main thing driving the, gr- the, the water comes from the soil. And the main thing at that point, if you have a 40 degree day, the main issue the plant has is it's just going to stop growing and it's going to stall. Hmm. And the concentration of tannins and phenolics and sugars and acid in the berry is going to not go well. So the main issue right then at that moment is like, can we bring the temperature down three to four degrees C? And the reason it's so easy to tie things like phenologies, bring leaf out, harvest dates and wine grapes to climate is that temperature is the main driver of all that plant development. And so it's, it's sort of predicting a large proportion of what happens. And yes, water matters, but the big thing that matters right then is temperature. Um, and so I think lots of places are experiencing changes in the wines they're producing, the, some of the big organizations that help with wine grapes in France are investing in trying to understand de-alcoholization techniques, so where you actually take a bottle of wine and try to pull the alcohol out so that you get it to a lower alcohol content. Really? Yep. Huh. Um, and then the thing I really focus on, and, and the thing I think is the reason that wine grapes are not in horrible shape, depending on what the market forces do, is that People came up with grape varieties that grow from Germany to southern Italy. That means places that are willing to change the varieties that they grow can change the varieties and grow a variety that is going to withstand higher temperatures and longer, hotter growing seasons. The issue is that people go to Napa and they want to buy a Cabernet Sauvignon. They Mm -hmm. don't want to buy a Sangiovese. And people go to Sonoma and they want to buy a Pinot Noir. They go to Burgundy for a Pinot Noir. Pinot Noir is a really finicky grape that needs cool weather. And so it's not going to last long and taste the same unless it's heavily manipulated. And that's the other option. You know, wine growers uh, sell their grapes to people who then can do all sorts of things afterwards to make them taste different than maybe the actual grape tasted. So, yes, I would say everyone I know in the wine industry is impacted by climate change. How much they want to talk about it depends on how much they've experienced it and how much their land is worth right now. If their (laughs) land is worth a lot of money... You know, the term terroir is what we talk about in, in wine grapes, and it, it's this undescribable combination of the soil, what the soil's like, what the water is like, what the seasons are like, how often we get hailstorms when it rains in the fall. And like 90% of what people talk about with terroir is climate. Yeah. Like, it's not what the soil is like. It's, it's if the soil is like Chateauneuf de Pop and it has giant round stones, those stones get incredibly hot. And they heat up the soil to really high temperatures. And that's, that's climate. That's the soil climate. And it's the soil climate um, that makes you know, shale places different than rocky places and all these sorts of things. And then it's the weather systems that define the climate about when you get the rains and do you not get the rains too soon so that you can harvest, et cetera, et cetera. So if you have terroir that is worth a lot of money and you say my climate is changing, you almost inherently say it's becoming worth less money right. because we, you know, as humans, we helped breed, breed wine grapes for several thousands of years now, and we bred them for a climate that has basically always been the same. And now it's one degree Celsius warmer. If you're in France, it is at least 1.6 degrees Celsius warmer. So those are the vineyard owners that are not wanting to talk about climate yes. change. <laughs> and so what are they doing to counter? Are they the ones shading their grapes? Um, because I mean, there has to be, there is some sort of flavor profile change. Yeah. Are they purchasing land in other pro, other places right now to try to keep the same pre- ter- terroir? Terroir. terroir. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the big companies are. Yeah. Like the really famous companies in Bordeaux that are worth a lot of money own land in China. And there's a lot of high, um, sort of the high foothills areas of the Ningxian province in China that are probably great to grow wine grapes. And we haven't grown them there before. Does that diminish the brand name though? I don't, I think this is the great, I think so many people in the wine industry. I haven't seen any of the Bordeaux houses release the grapes from China. And I also haven't seen Tattinger release from the United Kingdom. And I think in terms of market forces, it's a big question of these large companies have invested a significant amount of money in new lands in other countries. Yeah. (laughs) And I assume they have a thoughtful <laughs> process about when they will release those bottles. And it, it does not appear to be within like the first five years of working on the vineyard. I mean, it takes 
a minimum of five years in most places to get grapes growing. But I think they are working on a you know, 10 to 20 year timeline where they know 10 to 20 years from now, champagne's going to be pretty hot and it's going to be pretty hard to grow really high quality Pinot Noir, um, Pinot Meunier and oh, Chardonnay and make a great champagne. But if we start working on it in the United Kingdom now, maybe in 20 years, we'll make a great one. And, and I, I think they're banking on the market moving with them and the name profile. But I do think they're deciding that it would be better to grow the same varieties they grow somewhere else than to change the varieties they grow in Champagne and try to keep selling it. Because to me, those are the two options. I mean, right now, there are many little things you can do. You can put up shade cloth. I would say micro-misting is a big option, but you can certainly do it. You can... Also, I mean, you change how you trellis. So for example, in North America, we like to do this type of trellising that makes the grapes really exposed, but you could leave more leaves on and try to cover them. It's just sort of like basic 101. How do we make things cooler? We like shade them, we add water. Um, And that's what a lot of places are doing right now. And for the most part, in lots of places right now, that's making a difference. I think places that were already hot are struggling. Certainly I've heard stories in the Australian wine growing industry where it's really hot already in Australia, that are, are making more drastic changes. They're ripping up all their plants and putting in new varieties and changing the rootstock and trying basically everything they can to hold on to the area as a grape growing area. I, obviously, you've done a lot of research, but are you going out and visiting these places to do research? Yes. Wineries? Yeah. So like- I have lots of different sort of ways I do the research. Um, I collect data or I've been collecting data for six years now down in Davis, California. Davis is the premier viticulture and enology school, I would argue, for the U.S., if not North America. And so they have about 150 different varieties co-planted. And so I measure their phenology. When I say I, I mean wonderful student technicians who go and visit the vines every two to three days. Um, and, you know, I chat with them twice a year about how it's going. Uh, and we look at what's happening with those. There have been crazy years in Davis already where, I mean, Budburst is certainly several weeks earlier than in the past in Davis. And what you see, what you, which is what you don't want to see, is that in these really hot years, the vines sort of stall. So the berries stop developing. They stop changing color. The sugars and the acids do weird things that don't taste good. Um, so that's one thing I do. And then more recently, I've been working with growers in the Okanagan to try to get their data in phenology and see what's happening there. And then otherwise, a lot of my work is going out, meeting growers, trying to get them to share their data and create a relationship where I can see what's happening and tell them better what I think will happen. And then I also work with colleagues in France because in France... They, number one, they have these amazing long-term records, and they also have an incredible agricultural service that collects copious, copious amounts of data and knows how much the pH in wine grapes across the country has changed and the acid and the sugar and has really good information on what's actually happening. Like carrying over into agriculture, what happens to crops? What happens to food if we get to that two or three degree? increase in temperature and i'm assuming we're already seeing a big change in the way stuff grows in canada and the u.s i think we're seeing a big change in what people choose to grow where so i think growers are smart and they see the climate changing and they are changing how many crops uh, cycles they try to get in every year they try to sneak in another one Mm -hmm. they for those who can they're changing the crop that they grow and and that's something that We'll, we will just continue to see. So I think we can expect to see a lot more agricultural in Canada than we already see because parts of the U.S. will become too hot and dry that are currently contributing a lot to agriculture and Canada will pick up part of that burden is my suspicion. So I think that's the biggest change you're seeing already, that there are agricultural lands are basically moving northward or poleward, if you will, if you go to the southern hemisphere to track warmer climates where you can start to grow crops you couldn't grow before. People are growing an additional cycle of crops within a single growing season. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the problem with, so one of the problems with looking at alcohol content, for example, in wine is that climate change has a direct physiological mechanism where we can say, well, warmer climate should give us higher alcohol. At the same time, there's this person named Robert Parker who 
created the wine spectator and gave high point scores to high alcohol <laughs> wines. So, you know, you have to do careful statistics to tease out, well, how much of it is warming and how much is, of it is what we call the Robert Parker effect, which okay. is why like over oaked Chardonnays and what I call like fruit bomb Cabernets are really popular today because he likes those and he gave them high scores and people <laughs> bought them. And now every Chardonnay is over oaked. Um, it also made some of the wines more alcoholic. Agriculture has the same issue. I mean, the green revolution of fertilization has meant that agriculture has just been in transition almost nonstop since the 1950s. So it's a little bit hard to tease out the effects. But certainly we know that plants like wheat and other, I mean, so many of the sort of staple crops, what you're eating is you're eating the seed germ. So when you eat wheat, you're eating the seed. Hmm. When you eat corn, you're eating the seed. And we know from decades and decades of plant research is that when plants are stressed, they invest less in their seeds. They invest less in their fruit and they invest more in their vegetation or they just pull back on that ratio. So we're already seeing small changes in things like that, where we're seeing seed, the sort of ratio of seed to leaf production is going down. So plants are investing less in their seeds. We're getting less wheat germ out of every hectare of wheat in mm -hmm. certain areas. And that's what's predicted to increase in the future is that we'll start to see these effects where plants are investing less in the part of them that we want to eat, as well as massive shifts in where we plant things and how we plant them. And then continual effects of how do we transport food from all these places where we didn't used to grow food? How do we manage water resources from places that weren't using so much water mm -hmm. because they weren't agricultural lands, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> <laughs> I guess a lot of the people who are actually growing grapes, whatever they're growing crops are just adjusting to different temperatures and soils, whether it be growing something different or moving location. Yep. But w what are, what are people doing at the big scale to try to manage temperature rise? In terms of growers or in terms of what do we do as just, a globe? Yeah. Wh like, <laughs> what is the answer? <laughs> I mean, for people like myself who worked on climate change for many years, the answer has always been to reduce emissions yeah. and to create a system where there is, you know, an economic incentive to reduce your own carbon footprint. And with that, to increase technology that reduces your carbon footprint. So I don't think it's impossible to make planes that are much more fuel efficient. I think there's just absolutely a very low incentive. I mean, if you look right. at why the Boeing 737 was built. <laughs> it was built to reduce increased fuel economy because that was finally important enough that Airbus came out and said, we've introduced a smaller, you know, a plane that is lighter and has better fuel economy. And fuel prices have crept up enough recently that the air industry was excited to buy a plane that was lighter and reduced fuel economy. So then we had the Boeing 737, which has better fuel economy. So I think that was like a very tiny change in fuel prices to produce the two major air companies choosing to go into this new fuel efficient path that isn't yeah. even that fuel efficient, I think you would get massive improvements in technology. But there's just no incentive right now for people to make those changes. So in my mind, one of the best ways to deal with this is to create a system where people are incentivized to have new technology that makes it easier to reduce your carbon footprint and to reduce your carbon footprint. Right now, there's very little incentive for that. Um, the other options are basically to try to adapt <laughs> to incredibly high temperatures. And I think there are many, many issues with that. One is that, and this is something I struggle with communicating. Wait, so there's a big panel that tries to communicate and synthesize information on climate change. It comes together and produces a paper every, or giant report every five or seven years. It's by the UN, the United Nations, in the 1980s, said we should have an intergovernmental panel on climate change, the IPCC. And, and they will, will bring together the best scientists, they will collate the information, and they will report to you how much has the earth warmed, how has that changed the climate, and things like storms and wildfires, what are the influences that we now see on things I work on, plants, animals. And then what are the actual impacts on humans? Where mm -hmm. are people moving? Um, the Syrian war, for example, was induced by drought that is probably climate change related. So those really knock on effects in migration and um, people's livelihood and livelihoods and lives. And so that report comes together and tries to give us the best information. And when they started in the 1980s, 
they agreed that we would project changes until 2100. And I think in their minds, 2100 was an extremely worst case scenario that we wouldn't have reduced emissions. And so all the graphs stop at 2100 and we say like, oh, in the worst case scenario, it's like four to five degrees warmer globally. And it's like eight degrees warmer in the Arctic if we don't change our emission scenarios. But that graph just stops there because people in the 1980s thought that that was bad enough and everyone would look at it and say, well, that's horrible. We must stop before we get there. <laughs> and so I think, and I hear this from students too, well, so much, is, it's just so bad. There's no point in stopping. And I want to say, well, no, that curve keeps going. Like that, that 2100 mark isn't the end. That's just where we thought you'd all be horrified enough that you would change. And so I think the thing to remember is if we don't change, it's, it's not four degrees warming. It's, you know, eight degrees warming at the end of the next century. And it's just an astronomical amount of warming. And the warming keeps going. You know, greenhouse gases, the reason we really worry about carbon dioxide more than we worry about methane, for example. Carbon dioxide, when you put it in the atmosphere, it lasts for thousands of years. You can't, like, it doesn't fall out of the atmosphere. Methane, you put it in the atmosphere, it comes out 100 years later. So if we did a bunch of crazy things with methane and we regretted them, <laughs> if we stopped doing them 100 years from now, they, they would go away. They, the methane would come out of the atmosphere and we'd be fine. Carbon dioxide is up there unless we figure out a way to mechanically or geoengineering take it out for good. And so we will experience its effects for thousands and thousands of years, basically. And so the idea that we just don't deal with climate change is, is almost unimaginable because it means we will have no glaciers left. We will have no Antarctica with ice on it left. We will have an enormous loss of land. And it will be incredibly warm. Lots of places will have horrible diseases. We'll have deserts where we've never had deserts. I think it really will be the uninhabitable earth in many ways. People might live through that, but that's a really bad outcome. <laughs> and so I hope people will figure out a global way to reduce emissions. If that doesn't happen, we could have this incredibly hot world that will just keep getting warmer. Or the sort of third rail idea <laughs> is to geoengineer our ways out of it. And that is things like, can we figure out a way to extract the carbon we already put in the sky out and liquefy it and put it in rocks or put it somewhere else? Um, we had been talking previously about this idea that, you know, the sulfur umbrella, um, which is, there's lots of different versions of this. There was a version 10 years ago that was like, we'll put mirrors in the sky and they'll reflect the sun. These aren't crazy ideas. Um, that sounds like a pretty crazy idea. I mean, they're crazy Just in that. Just suspending mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, they are a method of reducing the heat. And as I was saying earlier, it's a method we already use intentionally or unintentionally. So um, when I was talking to somebody who was interested in learning about climate change and wine grapes, he asked me, well, what proportion of warming is caused by people? And, and I said, oh, I don't know the exact proportion. And he said, is it like 10% or 20%? And I said, no, 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 no. It's like 80 or 90% minimum. Like what we're experiencing right now is all on us and past generations. We have caused the warming that we are feeling. It is in no way natural and very little of it is sort of cyclical or normal or part of the climate system if there weren't humans producing greenhouse gases. And then he went to talk to a colleague of mine who works at NASA, who I said, he'll know the answer to this question. <laughs> and this person asked my colleague at NASA, how much of the warming is anthropogenic? And my colleague said, probably more than 100%. And his rationale was that, you know, most, it's all, we've caused so much tremendous warming, but we've also caused cooling unintentionally. So China, for example, produces like, in total amount, twice as much greenhouse gas than any other country. So the U.S. is second, but China's double what the U.S. is producing. So China, you know, arguably is producing a lot of greenhouse gases that are very, very bad and should cause lots of warming. People try to do accounting and attribute warming to different countries and say, well, the U.S. is responsible for this amount of global warming and China is responsible for this amount. And in those calculations, China is usually responsible for almost no global warming. <laughs> and part of that is because they've only been emitting a ton of carbon recently, whereas Canada and the U.S., we've been at this for many decades. 
And the other part that they get credit, if you will, for is that they are polluting and they are putting, you know, particulate matter into the atmosphere. So you see these horrifying pictures of Mark Zuckerberg <laughs> beijing and the sky is gray. Well, it's disgusting that the sky is gray and it increases the deaths of people in Beijing astronomically high because it causes all sorts of lung problems, but it also cools the air. So the reason you would say we have more than 100% contributed to global warming as people is that we have warmed the <laughs> earth so much and we've actually cooled it. And like the amount of warming that China has contributed, we won't see until they clean their atmosphere, basically. But then suddenly China will jump up and have contributed a lot to global warming. And so it's not irrational to think that a strategy to sort of keep global warming lower is to shade the earth. The issue is like, People don't live well when they have a lot of particulate matter in the air. Like this, their famous public health studies from London when they started the clean air movement to show how much people die at increased rates when the air is that heavily polluted. And plants don't really like polluted air. So the consequences of choosing to just change the color of the sky or put mirrors in it are really frightening to people like me as a tractable, potentially useful idea for climate change. I think of them as like absolutely insane. And why couldn't we just incentivize not emitting as much carbon? I don't, like, how would that even work if you're shading, using the term shading the earth? The earth would just be dark? Uh, it would be, I mean, how, I think it would be like Beijing, right? Or if you think of a day, if you've ever been in LA in a high pollution day, mm -hmm. it would just be, I mean, it might be different color, but it would be a little bit darker doesn't get to be as sunny if we choose to shade the earth. Plant life and crops would not grow very I, do, well. I haven't looked into the science on this aspect of geoengineering, as we call it, um, but it doesn't make a tremendous amount of sense to me that there's anything we could put in the atmosphere to shade the sun from hitting us so hard that, wouldn't, that we would have a good idea of what would happen to plants. Like, it, I just don't think maybe we could figure out what will happen to like rice and corn and hopefully wine grapes and wheat. <laughs> um, but we're not going to know what will happen to all the other crops and all the other issues. So it won't. Probably a lot less travel if, uh, if there's no sunlight anywhere. <laughs> Everywhere is gray. So why would you go to Hawaii? Or yeah. Why would, why would you I, go to the Caribbean? This is the, I mean, one of the concerns that people have is will one country try a geoengineering solution? And so in, this, in the very slow way, we, different countries have contributed, such as the United States, in a really large way to global warming, which we all share. But what if one country decides to try some crazy geoengineering method that's actually incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. and just send something into the atmosphere to pollute it? And that is one of the other big issues with geoengineering is that you can, you know, maybe you figure out a way to capture all the carbon from the sky and put it in liquid form. Well, what if somebody breaks into those liquid carbon reserves and releases them in the atmosphere? And on the flip side, what if some country decides, and maybe rationally so, I mean, the countries that are hardest hit by climate change right now are the poorest countries, the ones that are experiencing sea level rise that is obliterating their entire country. What if they choose to do a geoengineering solution? And we all share that. And the thing that's shocking about it is just the time scale, right? We, we actually chose to do the reverse on a very slow, long time scale, but we're horrified by the thought that one country would do, try to reduce climate change in one short snap. How far away are we from big changes? So the biggest concern well, so I So let's say carbon <laughs> yeah. emissions remain the same for the next 30 years. Carbon emissions remain the same for the next 30 years? Well, because I assume there's no big plan in place right now to reduce carbon emissions. Well, there's the COP21 Paris Agreement, where almost every country, except for the United States and two others that I can, maybe three others, agreed to reduce emissions and can try to hold them under two degrees C additional warming. So the, every several years, we have these international groups where all the governments come together and try to agree on an emissions plan and mm. the paris agreement happened just several years ago and that was an agreement where countries signed on and said they would try to reduce their emissions and hold warming to ideally less than two degrees celsius that was a couple of years ago yes are those countries that were involved in that agreement making progress i guess it depends <laughs> 
on your definition of progress. <laughs> um, you know, I think I'm an American, so I can say that I think it's horrifying and every citizen should be able to say this of the world that the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Agreement because of Trump and, and all the citizens of America who voted for him and think this is a good decision um, because the U.S. had a big opportunity to lead. And I think the U.S. has this massive technology sector. I mean, if you look at where emissions come from in the U.S. versus Canada, what you see is that Canada is kind of worse off because we're still a resource extraction country, because we still have mining exploration, because we still cut down forests and ship them overseas. Mm -hmm. And that's our carbon footprint yeah. that we carry. And we are still exploring for oil. And just the exploration process of oil and gas is incredibly um, polluting for greenhouse gases. So U.S. has this huge technology sector where you could really incentivize new technology for climate change. Um, so that's not progress. If you look at places in Europe, they're reducing their emissions and they're changing their policies. And I think they have a good shot of actually hitting their targets if they keep electing officials who put that as a priority. Um, Canada's kind of trying. I don't, they're not doing great. They're not doing as well as Europe. Um, and then the big questions are, what will China and India do? Because those are two of the biggest growing economies. Um, China is trying to reduce its emissions, at least on paper. And so I would say there is a little bit of progress. Um, emissions in many countries are going down. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little. But if China puts something in that they have to watch pollution, then there's just that much more carbon. No, I think, I think whatever happens, China will end up getting rid of the pollution that they have and will contribute more to warming. And that's sort of, as a climate scientist, the part that's kind of hard to communicate and so frightening is that it's going to keep warming. And that's why people don't want to do anything, because it's, it's probably not going to make... It's not going to make my day-to-day -day life better if I push for incentives to reduce carbon emissions outside of the sort of intrinsic peace I would have in knowing that the world is headed in the right direction versus headed towards you know, massive sea level rise. And I think in general, many of the countries, many of the big countries that signed on are heading in the right direction. They are not heading fast enough. There's just like so, as she's talking, Carl, there's so many things that pop into my head, like sea levels rise. Lots of coastal communities are now underwater. Where are these people going? Our deserts in the Middle East are too hot to survive. Where are these people going? Where, like where are the cops, hundreds hundreds crops being grown? Yeah, there's so many, so many questions. Where I get like, where do you go for good information, like, accurate information? Oh yeah. Um, so you emailed me like a few sort of, I'm interested in X, Y, Z and my main place that I recommend people go is climate.nasa.gov. So climate.nasa.gov. Yep. This is a U.S. site. Can and you create that down, Carl? <laughs> Thanks. It's fantastic. I mean, it's a beautiful site. It's easy to navigate. They update it daily. So I can find out what the carbon parts per million are today. Hmm. I can find out the current best estimate for sea level rise. You can look at the data. You can download the data. You can touch the data. You know, every thing that climate scientists are talking about is in a version there and you can dig as deep as you want to help you believe that it's going on. And I should say that at least 97% of scientists agree that climate change is happening and is caused by humans. And that is a low estimate. I would say more like 99% of scientists who study climate change believe it is happening and that it is caused by humans. And I would even add that it is a, a huge problem that they are worried about. Um, the other place that's really good for Canada is prairieclimatecenter.ca. And I, I think they are out of somewhere in the prairie. I want to say Winnipeg, but then I'm going to be worried I'm wrong. But they, they do a beautiful job of putting together data for Canada specific. And so if you want to see the breakdown of what, where emissions come from, transportation, big trucks, little trucks, trains, planes within Canada, mm -hmm. all of that is on Prairie Central, as well as forecasts for what do we expect the drought levels to be like in BC in the winter versus the summer versus the spring, all that sort of, you can really dig down and see what the predictions are for Canada. And what you see is this you know, it's sort of like yellow and orange, or it's really orange at the bottom of Canada, and it's this deep, dark red that's almost black in terms of how much warming we predict at those higher latitudes in Canada. You mentioned most scientists are on board. Yes. We'll agree that this is happening. Yes. What, let's say it's 
What is that one percent's argument that this is not happening? I have actually never met one of these one percent okay. people. Is it not that it's not happening? It's just that humans aren't causing it. There. So I think. And I think this has shifted over time. One of the, the early consensus studies came out in the 1990s and said 97. <laughs> and then there was more nuance to, okay, what do you mean by you think climate change is happening? And, and so the little bits of argument you will get is, well, how much of it is caused by humans and how much of it is like solar flares from the sun? A lot of the old crazy reasons for climate change have actually, we've had climate change for so long and we've now been talking about it for so long that they don't work anymore. So solar <laughs> flares was a big one, but now they've actually gone down. So we were, you know, the climate skeptics were banking on this solar flare thing. And it's been so long now that they've actually decreased just because they're this random thing that doesn't dramatically affect climate. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know any scientists who don't think that climate change is anthropogenically caused and is happening personally. I've never met one. Where, I guess, where do people 30 years from now, it's two or three degrees warmer, where are people moving to live? Because according to this David, what is it, Wallace Wells? Mm -hmm. At two degrees, it's basically like unlivable throughout most of the planet. Two degrees in addition to the one degree we've already had. So right. it's a three degree warming event in sort of my context. Um, I think it depends a little bit on your... So at three degrees warming, there are some issues with where you can live. So for example, you know, Florida is not a place I would buy real estate. And I, I am fascinated by people who buy real estate in Florida in any way, shape, or form, because it's basically, if you look at any of the projections for sea level rise, Florida is gone. Like soon. Very soon. Yeah. Um, and companies that invest in buying land in Florida have already quietly pulled all their money out of Florida. So interesting. Miami yeah. um, already actively pumps seawater every day to try to keep the streets in Miami working. And I think you will see that for large stretches of New Jersey, pieces of Vancouver. Um, so there's the issue of where do people live? The places that are low lying will be hard. It will be almost impossible to live in because of large scale flooding and also just nuisance flooding. Just every time there's a storm, your house floods. So eventually you just stop living in your house. <laughs> um, and then there are the issues of where is it sort of too hot or dry? Um, parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East the Syrian um, civil war that, you know, you can easily connect the dots to Brexit and to the crisis of sort of um, extremely one direction politics in parts of Europe comes from that immigration crisis. That drought is tied to climate change. So if you think of that as being like a teeny tiny taster of yeah. what the future is, I think it's really hard to know where people will go because there will be all these crazy immigration and migration stories of like what countries will let people in and which countries won't and where will people just find a way to get in because at some point you've had so much mass migration from sea level rise. I mean, sea level rise is by far, I am fascinated by what might happen with plants and climate change and changes in forest communities. I don't think it matters or will matter. I don't think we are in a situation currently where we will have an active plan of how to manage British Columbian forests if we don't have an emissions plan. Because if we're going to have emissions continue at the pace they're at, I can't imagine where we will have the resources to be focusing on, well, which trees should we help adapt and which ones are probably going to go locally extinct so we should do XYZ differently. I think we are going to be dealing with massive migration, disease, and food security issues that will easily outweigh anything about forest community dynamics. And I think that is the global scale giant issue. So when I think of climate change as a person, it is all about sea level rise. And the amount of, I mean, we've already had sea level rise of about 0.2 meters over the last hundred or so years. We're getting three to four millimeters a year of sea level rise. And the projections are a meter by the end of the century, or but they, I think they range from 0.3 meters at the very low, you know, at the very optimistic end. So that would be half a meter total by the end of the century. And again, just to say, it keeps going. <laughs> it, if we keep warming, we get more and more and more and more and more sea level rise. Or 
um, sort of average projections. These aren't the extreme projections are 1.3 meters in addition to what we've already had. So one and over one and a half meters of sea level rise. Um, that just catastrophically reshapes shorelines. Oh, totally. And I think some cities will deal with it. And, you know, I, I, what year is like 2014. I just started my job in Boston. I went down to NASA to visit um, my colleague who works on climate change. It was February. We were standing on the Upper West Side waiting for a bus to go to this climate institute called Lamont Doherty outside the city. It was freezing cold. I was with my postdoc who was pregnant. And it was like, you know, horrible February in, in New York. It's windy. It's cold. It's disgusting. Hurricane Sandy had hit the year before. And and I was talking to my colleague about we're going to have to you know, leave New York due to sea level rise. And he very matter of factly said, no, we're going to dike New York. <laughs> and I was horrified mostly because of like the socioeconomic things that that means. It means that the rich countries will find a way to protect their greatest property and sure. whatnot assets. And the poor countries don't have that benefit. Um, and it was the first time it occurred to me that that probably will happen. Certain places, we will make choices about which cities to try to save and which cities to let go. I think most people realistically think Florida gone, Miami gone, but places like New York, I think will obviously try to do something about, you know, Wall Street and south of there is all apt to be a problem with sea level rise. Parts of Vancouver, when you look at the maps, just immense parts have sea level problems. Most airports, I'm always fascinated by airports because most airports just, are built on fill. Yeah. So all the airports are like hyper low lying, um, but maybe it's easy to add more fill. Um, but the sea level rise is the, 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 just the greatest catastrophe that's coming. And most people I know agree on that. And it's also really hard because it's an area of science where we just didn't figure it out as fast as we needed to. So I think there's great work on this, a scientist named Eric Rignot, um, and he's done a bunch of, you can look up Vice, is a, Vice does a great series of videos um, based in the US, you can watch them in Canada. Uh, and most of them I've been able to find on, v, on um, Vimeo or YouTube in Canada where they go and talk to people in Greenland and talk to the scientists in our and really spell out what we're talking about with sea level rise. And Eric Rignot has been very open about, we knew in the 80s that we needed to figure out how to predict glaciers collapsing and ice sheets coming off Antarctica and Greenland. We knew it was critical. But it was also really complicated. And you know, I remember seeing the papers coming out where they started to figure out that actually when these things happen, the water goes to the bottom of the ice sheet and starts to sort of speed up this like river that's forming mm. underneath the um, glacier. And that wasn't in any of the models. When you add it, things go faster. And, and when a big part breaks off in this certain way, things go faster. And so they basically just haven't had time to do enough science to get really accurate predictions of sea level rise. So in general, parts of the West Antarctic ice sheet are collapsing faster than predictions 10 years ago were made. And that's a place where we haven't gotten it right. And in general, we've probably erred on the conservative side. So my greatest fear is when you see people who monitor the large glaciers in Antarctica that they are watching go, you know, there's many meters of sea level that could go and what part of the world goes and when is the big question so for example if the way glaciers work is they put this massive weight on land right so literally canada the, the earth is still like by a couple millimeters every year like rising up because we had a giant giant ice sheet sitting on canada and it weighed the earth down and so when you lift a glacier off Earth, the Earth goes up. And this is actually one of the big climate denial angles. People will say, how can climate change be true if the predictions say that when the ice sheets go off Greenland, Greenland will actually have sea levels drop? And that's because Greenland actually sort of lifts out of the ground mm -hmm. when you release the weight of the glaciers and the ice that is on Greenland. And, and what happens is everywhere kind of around Greenland gets a little bit of a boost, including, for example, Canada. And the places that get hit really hard are the places in South America that are further away. Um, but the place that's melting astronomically fast right now is the West Antarctic Ice Sheet. And if the West Antarctic Ice Sheet goes, 
Patagonia, parts of Australia, Tasmania, those places will see minor changes in sea level. If anything, sea levels will go down. And the places that will see massive increases in sea level are right here. Washington, D.C., parts of California, parts of the Canadian coast. That's where the big impact is. So the dynamics of sea level are more complicated than we ever knew. And none of them are really going in our favor. Like we didn't screw any of them up in a way where we say, actually, we think the outcome is much better. It seems that most of the science coming out is that things are moving faster than we predicted. How did you get involved in this? I worked on invasive plants, which are invasive here as well. They're invasive in California and they're invasive here. And um, I had this, after working on them for a few years, I started to wonder if part of why they were doing so well is actually because growing seasons are longer. And so the plants that are invasive are these weird plants from Europe that just basically occupy the new part of the growing season. Like they <laughs> occupy the start of the growing season. There's new growing, the growing season's earlier. And they just show up and occupy what we would call this vacant niche. And so that's how I got interested in it, just watching these invasive plants and trying to figure out what made them so successful. And it seemed like maybe climate change had a role. And so I got interested in it from there. There were no good global estimates of how much plants had really shifted leafing and flowering with climate change. They were all based in Europe. And so I wanted to work on that. And that sort of one thing led to another. And have been fortunate enough. I think it's fascinating science. It's just also horrifying. How long ago was that? I have been working on climate change since 2008, 2009. So in 10 years, have you, as you're learning more and more about the science behind it, are you becoming more optimistic or pessimistic? Oh, I think I have like a nonlinear relationship with hope and climate change. Um, <laughs> I think I definitely started out like all of us thinking, I've heard it's bad, but I'm not really concerned. And yeah. I wasn't, you know, 2009, not that much had really happened. Um, I hadn't, we hadn't had Hurricane Sandy, which had a big impact on New York. We hadn't had, you know, these shifts in wildflowers, these, you know, we hadn't had Katrina, maybe we hadn't had a lot of sort of the repeating impacts that were really catastrophic or sort of hinting at what was coming. Um, so it, it wasn't a big part of my life. And then when I got more and more into the science, I got more horrified and, and really pessimistic and now I'm more optimistic because which is funny because we have Trump as president of the United States. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm very uncertain about that. I would say like the highest uncertainty I have is over that. That is not a good sign. Um, but in some ways, I think it's better that things are bad because it's making people more concerned about what's going on. Right. And, and that is what gives me hope is that more people are talking about um, the wildfires and the hurricanes and just the warmer days and the hotter temperatures. And, and that provides a conversation point for people to start thinking about what to do. And I think that's the start. Um, I also think the COP21 agreement in Paris was a good agreement to try. It actually has the pathway to try to get emissions down. So that's the first time we've had that sort of agreement, even if the U.S. is pulling out every other country that really matters is on that agreement and is trying to make it happen as far as we can tell. So that all gives me hope. And I think working with students, students seem more pissed off. And I think that's hopeful. They're less complacent about the problem. Mm -hmm. They seem more you know, annoyed and angry and want to see it change. And I think that's a good start. Um, I do think many students and many people think it's so bad. What is there to do? And that's right. I just am horrified because to me, the message is we somehow screwed up the message and I don't quite yet know how to fix it. Because the message should have been like, we need to change this now. But if we don't, it'll be even worse the next day. We somehow have this message of it's really bad. We're screwed. And that missed the point of like, and we will be more screwed tomorrow <laughs> if we don't do something today. And if we don't do something tomorrow, the best time to do something is the day after that. So it's sort of weird. Today is the day to act, unless it's not today. If we don't do it today, then tomorrow is the day to act sort of message. Um, I want people to know that the projections of what we've committed to aren't good. They're troubling. They're not going to be a great experience for all of us. But what we have yet to commit to is so much worse. So can we avoid that? <laughs> <laughs>
Did you see the article recently, Carl? Uh, I think it was Canada. By 2040, there's going to be no more gasoline-powered cars manufactured. Hmm. Yeah. Is that correct? Is I that don't know. Uh, I think there is a lot of legislation. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like Germany has that and other European Union nations have that as well. Just sort of let's get rid of... Because it's not that hard. Yeah. Like the technology has even shown up given how little incentive we've given the technology. And it's fairly affordable for cars anyway. Mm-hmm. I remember Elon Musk was on Joe Rogan and he was asking about airplanes and can you do can you build an electric airplane? And Elon Musk is like very short about it, but he's like, <laughs> "Yes, we can." And so Joe is like, "Well, are you putting that into production? Are you And and his Elon Musk's comment was cost too much money no one would fly on it so he's like we can do it it just would be like are people going to spend ten thousand dollars to fly from la to chicago probably not right but i mean elon musk cars are successful because the ability to make better batteries went faster than anyone predicted so he's sort of projecting that cost of an airplane on current knowledge and current practices and you know 20 years ago solar panels were unfathomably unaffordable for most Mm -hmm. people and you can look at the knowledge curve of like how much money it costs to produce each panel and it was just like ticking along at going nowhere really it's just still cost a lot to build solar planners panels still cost a lot still cost a lot and then there were innovations and suddenly everybody got solar panels because we learned how to make them cheaper so i mean i assume the same thing would happen for the plane if there was incentive for it to happen i think that was just as common as he's like right now it doesn't make sense yeah no one would fly on it. What can well we'll end this way? What can normal, regular people do in their everyday lives to to help? You mentioned one thing which I thought was cool was like talk about it. Yeah. So say you're getting new light bulbs and tell people about it. Yes. What yeah. Else? I think I mean there's sort of two major ways to act in my mind. One is to reduce your carbon footprint, and if you do it, mention it. Um, use LED lights. Try to bike to work. Use public transit whenever you can buy an electric car if that is an affordable option for you and you know where your electricity is coming from and Mm. you know you don't replace the car so i mean all these things add up if you keep replacing your car then actually it's not a great carbon footprint um maybe consider changing your diet change your airline habits there's lots of things you can do and lots of websites to help you figure out what might be the best ways to reduce your carbon footprint do that you can also do carbon offsets you can try to purchase carbon you know invest in forests or invest in other infrastructure that would help um increase the carbon sort of resilience of other communities while you're using up carbon so maybe you take that flight but you go ahead and invest in a carbon offset system and lots of companies especially conservation companies for example i'm sure other companies as well but the companies i know are conservation companies actually allow their employees that choice where when they are booking a flight, they have to have a carbon offset or they have to actually calculate that. So that actually happens. Cool. And then talk about it. That's the biggest way to have your carbon choices make a difference is to let people know that you're doing them and they mean something to you. And then I think the other way is to try to encourage um, governance that believes that we should incentivize reducing carbon. And so look at how candidates talk about climate change and look at their climate action programs and do they have one? Um, If you're voting for a candidate who is a climate change denialist, number one, they are just dead wrong. There is no (laughs) science that I've ever seen that supports anything they say in general. And in fact, that's one of the interesting things in the time I've been, and maybe this is what gives me hope, been doing climate change science is they used to have these angles of like, it's not happening. And now they don't say it's not happening anymore. They have a messaging meeting at least once a year where they come up with new messages. And the new messaging in the last five or 10 years has always been it is happening, but it's not bad. And it's, it's, maybe it's not our fault. So just the fact that they no longer think they can pretend it's not happening to me is partial progress, sure, that yeah. they now have to admit it's happening and they're trying to repackage the happening. Um, so don't support people who are in any way climate change denialists. Don't support people who don't have a path to dealing with climate change and, and also make that voice heard and talk to other people about why you believe in that and why you think it's important. I think those are the two biggest things. I don't think It would be fantastic if they go hand in hand, if you're thinking about your carbon footprint and you're trying to encourage local, regional and global, countrywide and global governance that believes that reducing emissions is a critical goal. 
But if you're not worried about your carbon footprint and you're out there like stumping for people who are at the top of trying to deal with climate change, you're making a huge change and a huge impact as well. So you should think about the pathway that works for you. Carl, anything else? Oh, that was good. That lots, was lots of information. It's so yeah. informative. I love it. Um, we should put those two uh, websites yep, that she on. mentioned into the podcast notes. Thank you so much for coming on. That was very informative. Thank you. I had a great time. I'm just like so genuinely curious about it. I think know. everyone is. And that's yeah. one of the fascinating things to me as a, as a climate scientist. And it's really helpful to hear what people don't know because totally. I sit around and know it. And it's hard for me to be reminded that people don't know it. And I also, and I think, how could you know it? There, it's so hard to find the information and it's so hard to sift through it. And a lot of the reports that are released are like 40 pages long, I've noticed. It's not that hard to get the basics. That's what I really appreciated about you. <laughs> <laughs> she sent me a few articles today that she has either spoken or put together and they were all like three pages max. Oh, yeah. I've talked to Perfect. like colleagues yeah. who are wonderful people. And I say, what resources do you recommend for people who want to learn about climate change? And they say, oh, the National Academy report. And the National Academy report is great. I think it's like 20 or 30 pages. Yeah. And I don't blame anyone for not investing a Sunday afternoon, even if it's raining, in reading that. And actually, you can go to climate.nasa.gov, Prairie Climate, and get a lot of information answer there and i would also say youtube is way more useful totally. and easy to reach and there's so much good information on there um and those resources are readily available to check out so that's what i love about podcasts is they're passive you listen to them while you're working out or in the car or whatever and everyone should go or listen to this bike, david the wallace car. well <laughs> no cars <laughs> or on public transit yeah, exactly. that's what i love about yeah. public transit you can just totally zone out and listen to a good podcast totally Thanks again so much for coming on. It's great to meet you. Thank you both. Great to meet you. That's it, Carl. That's it. That was perfect. I would love to hear feedback, guys. Hit me up on Instagram, denny.duma. Good night.